And uh, if everybody could mute themselves, please, so we don't have background noise. Steve, just to let you know, um, the White Memorial is um, about three, four minutes away. Their class just ended. So they'll be coming on shortly. Okay, thanks. So as I said, I timed the talk for about 40 to 45 minutes. Um, so I'm not checking to see what time it is. That's great. We should be fine on time. It's we've got a full hour and um, yeah, you know, we should have ample time for Q&A, even if we start here a few minutes late. We'll give people till 1125 so Memorial can join. Okay, why don't we get started now? It's uh, 25 past. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our student lecture being sponsored by the Roy Chapman Andrews Society, whose purpose is to inspire scientific discovery. My name is Steve Vavris, and I'm president of the society. Before we get going this morning, I have a few housekeeping requests. One is to use the chat function for questions after the lecture. We've got ample time for that and you can field your questions there, uh, put your questions in there and uh, we'll address those. The second one is to please keep your audio and video off during the presentation. So first, a little bit of background. Roy Chapman Andrews was one of the most famous scientific explorers of the 20th century, and he was the only Beloiter to ever grace the cover of Time Magazine. Every year, the Roy Chapman Andrews Society honors an internationally renowned scientist with our Distinguished Explorer Award, the DEA. This year's DEA is extra special because it commemorates the 100th anniversary of Andrews' first Central Asiatic expedition to the Gobi Desert of Mongolia 
where he and his team wowed the world by discovering the first nests of fossilized dinosaur eggs. We encourage everyone to learn more about Andrews at the brand new exhibit we have at the Beloit Public Library, where you can view banners filled with photos and descriptions of Andrews' life, including his early childhood years in Beloit. There's also memorabilia from his expeditions that were donated by his granddaughter, Sarah Appleby. We'll have an exhibit kickoff this evening at seven o'clock at the library by local author Ann Bossom. We also hope you'll attend this week's lecture by today's speaker and DEA recipient, Professor Philip Curry, who will share his own experiences exploring the Gobi Desert and elsewhere. That presentation will be held on Friday afternoon at 4.30 also at the public library. These events require a lot of planning and financial backing. And we are very grateful for the outpouring of support we've received from the community, both here in Beloit and elsewhere. And at this time, I'd like to acknowledge our partners and sponsors of this year's DEA event, including the morning's, this morning's lecture. And to do that, I'm gonna share my screen. and put up our sponsor banner here. So hopefully everybody can see that, I'll slide it over. And so this is a collection of corporations, foundations, businesses in the Beloit area, individuals, uh, both in the Beloit area and beyond across the country and even around the world, Canada and Mongolia. So we've really got an international reach and this year was an especially big year for sponsorships, thanks to our 100th anniversary. And I also want to specifically point out the Beloit Public Library as a partner in this year's DEA event. And I'm actually speaking right now from the Public Library. And for this morning's talk, it's especially important to recognize those who made particular donations to support our student attendance at this Friday evening's DEA dinner. Those, those organizations and people are listed at the bottom here. And then of particular relevance, of course, for this morning's student lecture are the various school districts participating. So I wanna recognize those, the School District of Beloit, Beloit-Turner, Clinton, Lincoln Academy, and South Beloit. So I will stop sharing and transition now. So to welcome everyone to this morning's student lecture, I'm pleased now to introduce the superintendent of the Beloit Turner School District, Dr. Dennis McCarthy. Good morning to all of you as we welcome our area students to this special event. As the superintendent of the school district Beloit Turner, it is an honor to share this moment with not only my own students here at Turner, but with others in the area, including students again from the school district of Beloit, Lincoln Community Schools, the Lincoln Academy, and South Beloit. We're lucky to have an event like this in our region, and as students, you are in for a unique treat today. Today's event has a number of special connections for me personally. Having worked in the School District of Beloit for 10 years and here at Turner for 18 years, I have been able to see this special recognition grow since its beginning in 2003. My connection to Roy Chapman Andrews and to the society organizing this recognition have a special meaning to me. As a graduate of Beloit College and a biology major, the name of Roy Chapman Andrews was one of legends in our science community. We were taught many things in my studies of science at Beloit College, but there's one thing that stood out to me most and something that I carried in my own teaching of science. I had many outstanding professors at Beloit College, but the one who challenged me the most was John Junk a professor and scholar referred to as an expert in mathematical evolutionary biology. Now that title is a mouthful, but it was how he taught that pushed us to dig deeper into the sciences. He taught us the study and principles of the three Ps when pursuing our science education, problem posing, problem solving, and persuasion of peers. In a nutshell, this means you should always be seeking to question and study the world around you. There's not necessarily a right answer to your questions, but at the end of your work, it is important to be able to relate your research to your peers so they can determine the validity of your work. It was a challenging environment, but one that made me a better scientist and teacher. It is this type of philosophy that leads us to recognizing the distinguished explorers 
were ultimately chosen by the Roy Chapman Andrews Society. And I am certain this year's Distinguished Explorer will meet those expectations. I mentioned earlier that my professor always pushed us to dig deeper. Well, this year's recipient not only does that figuratively, but he literally digs deeper. Dr. Philip Curry is going to share some stories of his path in the study of paleontology, a path that actually has some special similarities to our own legend, Roy Chapman Andrews. It gives me great pleasure to have our local students have the opportunity to meet and interact with the work of Dr. Philip Curry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. Good morning. <laughs> oh, and, and I will now introduce our, our speaker for today, uh, <laughs> Professor Curry. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, honor him as the recipient of this year's Distinguished Explorer Award. Dr. Philip Curry of the University of Alberta's Department of Biological Sciences. And he will be presenting from his own research lab in Edmonton, which makes this literally the first international DEA presentation ever. Professor Curry is a dinosaur paleontologist and museum curator whose career path very much follows that of Roy Chapman Andrews. Dr. Curry's explorations stretch around the world, including sites in Canada, Argentina, and the Gobi Desert. His work has advanced our understanding of the evolutionary link between dinosaurs and birds and provided evidence of group behavior in carnivorous dinosaurs. Among his many honors, Professor Curry received the Royal Canadian Geographical Society's gold medal and, just like Andrews himself, has appeared on the cover of the Canadian issue of Time Magazine, which also ranked him among Canada's top five explorers. His lecture today is entitled, Collecting Dinosaurs from Pole to Pole, and please remember to be thinking of questions to pose in the chat box for the Q&A following the lecture. So I will now turn it over to Professor Curry, and you can have at it. Thanks again. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I decided to uh, speak about this because uh, it's not something people expect. Uh, people usually think of dinosaurs as being warm-blooded animals and are sorry, cold-blooded animals and therefore animals that were confined to tropical regions. And that's just not true. Uh, we've learned over the years that dinosaurs basically inhabited every continent, including uh, Antarctica and uh, polar regions in Canada as well, and other parts of the world too. So it's um, a little bit different, uh, but it also tells you a little bit about paleontology itself and how far we'll go to look for dinosaurs. Now, Roy Chapman Andrews, uh, he did uh, some pretty amazing things and he worked in unmapped regions of Asia. Uh, basically, uh, he didn't know how successful he would be. He didn't know uh, he, that he would find dinosaurs. He certainly didn't know he was going to find dinosaur eggs. These were uh, surprises that came out of this. Uh, but uh, uh, he had the right kind of attitude and he had the right kind of team with him to do that kind of thing. And uh, it's very important that uh, we work together as different kinds of scientists and uh, from different parts of the world as well. Um, so uh, Andrews gave us a lot of inspiration in terms of our own modern expeditions, uh, something that was forgotten for many years, but uh, these days uh, it's uh, very, very important. Now, I wanted to uh, start off with a slide which gives you an idea of what it's like to be in polar regions. It's not necessarily what you uh, think it's going to be. It's certainly not comfortable. So uh, we've been pinned down for days uh, in windstorms like this one and uh, very cold situations, uh, not very pleasant and things do get that way. And I'm not gonna speak further about that because the discomforts of field work uh, apply whether you're working in a place like Alberta or a place like uh, uh, Greenland or Antarctica. It's just something you have to take uh, with a grain of salt and uh, continue with your work. And you do what you can when you can. Now, this is a shot of the uh, North Polar region uh, focused uh, with the North Pole in the center of it. 
And all those red dots, which represent uh, uh, Alaska, Russia, uh, Greenland, Spitsbergen, and parts of Canada, those are areas that have produced dinosaurs. And uh, these aren't wonderful specimens. They're uh, dinosaurs that uh, are usually in very poor condition, but they're identifiable dinosaur fossils. And they tell us that the dinosaurs actually lived in those regions. And the area I work, though, is uh, Alberta, Canada. And uh, we have a lot of badlands here. Uh, this is a, a site that we have in Dinosaur Provincial Park in southern Alberta. The uh, people are squatting on the ground there, picking up bro bone fragments. And that's just how much bone is there. Uh, it's a huge area where uh, at least 70 individuals of the animal Centrosaurus, which is the dinosaur in the painting in the lower right-hand corner, where they died. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because Alberta is one of the richest dinosaur sites in the world. And we have many places where we collect uh, large numbers of individuals of the same species in exactly the same place. And what this indicates to us is that these animals were in fact moving around in herds. One of the reasons we think they were moving in herds is because we think they were in fact migrating in and out of the Arctic and uh, that uh, during the winter months, it wasn't all that cold up in the Arctic uh, when they were alive 75 million years ago, but nevertheless, it was dark. And when it's dark, plant-eating dinosaurs could not find food because the leaves would all drop and there was just nothing for them to eat. So we think that they collected together into big herds and moved south into Alberta and uh, uh, they've stayed there for the winter, uh, found enough food. Once the weather started getting warm again, they would collect together into big herds again and move north. And uh, this is what got my interest in uh, uh, polar dinosaurs going in the first place when we started doing this work a long time ago. Whoops, uh, wrong way. And uh, that may sound kind of crazy that uh, dinosaurs would do that kind of thing, but of course, modern animals do it too. These are caribou, and these are caribou that died en masse in northern Quebec uh, in 1985. Uh, it's uh, part of a herd numbering 100,000 animals, and 100,000 animals tried to cross a river in flood one night in uh, 1985 and about 10,000 caribou died. And they drowned because the river waters were in fact in flood, the current was too strong, the animals panicked, and they got washed away down south. So this kind of thing goes on today, and it was also going on in the age of dinosaurs. And uh, we know that uh, dinosaurs, um, like modern animals, had a lot of uh, behavioral traits that made them uh, very successful in their world, just the same way that caribou in our world. Now, this herd that died, uh, 90,000 animals still lived. They got across the river in flood, and they went on to reproduce, and it was still a successful herd. So the strategy worked for the herd overall, but it didn't work for these 10,000 animals that died. Our first trip into the Arctic was part of the Canada-China Dinosaur Project. And uh, we worked in the Gobi Desert of uh, China uh, to look for dinosaurs. And uh, we reciprocated by inviting our Chinese colleagues to come with us to both Alberta and to Arctic Canada to, to look for dinosaurs with us there. And so they got a good sense of uh, how rich Alberta was for dinosaur bones and how uh, poor the dinosaur bones were, in fact, in, in Arctic Canada, but nevertheless, they found things, and that was pretty cool. Most of them aren't that great. This is a single dinosaur vertebra uh, from a duckbill dinosaur, and that was found on Axel Heiberg Island. Uh, the place where we had more luck, though, was a couple of years later. Uh, we worked in a place called Pond Inlet. Uh, from a place called Pond Inlet. And the place we were going to, though, was Violet Island, which is right across the straits from Pond Inlet. And the site is just that uh, place that the yellow arrow is pointing to. 
And in that site, we found more than 100 fragments of dinosaurs. And none of them were very good, but uh, uh, nevertheless, they could be identified. And uh, in this picture, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see part of a duck-billed dinosaur jaw. And uh, the specimen below it is an articulated skeleton that was found in Alberta. But we can compare the two, and we can see that the fragments from above are, in fact, the same kind of dinosaur, a hooded duck-billed dinosaur, as what we find in Alberta. And uh, so that gives us information. Uh, we know what the whole animal looks like from good skeletons, but from the Arctic, we know that uh, their distribution went all the way up into the Arctic, which is pretty cool. Uh, we've also worked in Greenland, a uh, pretty amazing place as well. Uh, we've looked for dinosaurs here. Uh, we've looked at other Arctic islands in Canada too. And I can tell you it's a lot of work looking for dinosaurs. We had up to 18 hours a day walking and not finding anything in some cases. Uh, so it can get very frustrating. But when you do find those couple of uh, isolated bones, it, it's uh, super exciting. Now, because of my work in the Arctic, I actually got invited to go down to Antarctica to look for dinosaurs as well. And uh, dinosaurs have been found in a number of places. Uh, towards the upper left, you'll see a place called Vega Island and James Ross Island. In uh, 1986, actually, whoops, same year that I worked for the first time in Arctic Canada, uh, these fragments of bone were found and teeth, and they're coming from a uh, armored dinosaur. And uh, in fact, armored dinosaurs were very poorly known uh, in the Southern Hemisphere at that time, and yet they turned up in Antarctica. Uh, so that was pretty exciting. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we went back to the same site and uh, we were able to identify the site because of the fact that uh, we had photographs from 1986, the above one, and uh, we were able to refine the site. And uh, we buckled down and uh, scraped the entire surface and we came up with a lot of bones of that original uh, armored dinosaur that had uh, uh, been left behind because they hadn't been found. They'd been buried by the wind onto the soil and so on. And uh, we were able to um, get a lot more information about that armored dinosaur from Antarctica. However, the most wonderful specimen uh, from Antarctica was actually found by somebody from Rock Island, Illinois, just downstream from you guys. And uh, uh, in 1989, a geologist was hiking up a mountain uh, called Mount Kirkpatrick. And uh, he was taking geological information so that he could uh, learn about uh, the history of that area. And he found some bones that were clearly dinosaur bones. And he invited uh, Dr. William Hammer, who was a paleontologist working in Antarctica at the time on earlier animals, not dinosaurs. And he went over and uh, confirmed that number one, the bones that had been found in Mount Kirkpatrick were in fact dinosaur bones. And that was really exciting for 1989. Now they tried to collect those dinosaur bones, uh, which were from one single skeleton. And uh, those dinosaur bones though, uh, were incomplete for a different reason. They'd been eroded over the years. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, uh, he knew there was a lot more there, so he wanted to go back and try and collect the rest of it. So in uh, 2003, uh, I joined Dr. Hammer and I flew down to Antarctica and uh, uh, we worked out of a place called uh, McMurdo on Ross Island. This is the uh, American base on uh, Ross Island uh, that they used to jump off to large portions of Antarctica to try and find uh, all kinds of scientific information, not just dinosaurs. This is a, a base for uh, many, many scientists who work here during the summer months in the Southern Hemisphere. 
And uh, uh, one of the first things we did when we got to McMurdo was to take uh, survival camp. And uh, so my first night wasn't spent in a hotel in McMurdo. It was spent out in a survival camp where I had to build um, my own accommodation to sleep in overnight in case I ran into a situation where uh, I was going to be abandoned for a period of time and I had to survive. And so uh, I should point out that in the upper uh, right-hand corner, you can see what looks like a volcano, that's Mount Erebus. And that is an active volcano uh, right near McMurdo. And uh, that's, that's pretty cool views when you can see an active volcano and all the snow-covered slopes. Um, I didn't make an igloo. I made a, a basically uh, sort of like a, a long hole in the ground where I could set up my sleeping bag. And I was pretty warm, even though it was cold outside. And uh, I spent my night here, uh, first night in Antarctica. It was pretty neat, nevertheless. And uh, uh, you do dress very warmly, uh, but uh, um, <clears throat> that has its problems too. It means if you want to uh, go out and uh, uh, put it delicately, go to the bathroom, uh, you have to basically uh, have all your clothes on and then you have to get them all off and then you have to go back in again and so on. So it's, it's got a lot of inconveniences. Uh, the animals down there are pretty fantastic. These are seals. Uh, the seals crawl up on the ice. They're, they're really interesting because they... Uh, they really don't notice people very much at all. Uh, their enemies are enemies in the sea, things like killer whales and so on. Um, so people can walk right up to them and uh, uh, take pictures like these. Uh, the sea, uh, penguins, though, were the most amazing things. And uh, we were going across the ice one day on a skidoo, and we saw these penguins in the distance and uh, you're told that you're not allowed to approach the wildlife really. Um, basically, if it approaches you, that's okay, but uh, you don't approach them. They were about a quarter of a mile away. And when they saw us and we stopped to take photographs from that distance, they just walked over to see us. And uh, as they walked over to see us, they were curious about us. So they walked around us. And uh, um, these are some of the photographs we got of uh, emperor penguins. And uh, they were curious for about uh, 10 minutes or so. And then they decided we were kind of boring. So they walked away and did their own thing. These are a different kind of penguin called deli penguins. And the deli penguins are much smaller. And uh, we visited a colony of the deli penguins where there were thousands of penguins uh, in the colony. And we stood up on the shore and we looked down on them. They showed absolutely no interest in us whatsoever. Uh, but then we went back to our camp and our camp was on the other side of the island, completely out of sight from the, the, the penguins. And about half an hour later, around the side of the island, down at uh, sea level, uh, half a dozen of these penguins walked into our camp and then just spent time watching what we were doing. And we have no idea how they knew we were there uh, because they, uh, they were in the colony and uh, they had gone around the island and not over top of the island the way that we did. Um, so it was very curious to say the least, but the uh, same thing happened after about half an hour of observing us in camp, watching us eat supper and so on. I thought, ah, this is kind of boring. We'll go back to the rest of the colony. And they walked away uh, and around the island again. Uh, this is an area where there's been a lot of explorers, uh, people like Shackleton and Scott, and they went uh, uh, in their quest to get to the South Pole in the early parts of the 1900s. And because it's so cold down there, things have a way of staying the same for a long period of time. And so these are the cabins that they had built to stay warm during the winter months uh, while they waited for the summer to warm up so they could do their exploration and their trips down to the South Pole. And uh, you could walk in these uh, cabins, uh, which are historic sites, and you could look on the shelves and you would see they were eating all kinds of wonderful things like uh, canned bone marrow and canned cabbage. 
and you could see their sleeping bags still lying on the uh, the beds that they left behind in the end. Uh, it was a pretty tough life for these explorers at the time. And uh, uh, of course, many of them did not return to civilization. Scott was one of the explorers who died, uh, but uh, when he was uh, working in Antarctica, he also uh, collected a lot of scientific information that he brought back with him. Uh, this was recovered uh, in different places. These are fossil leaves that he had found in Antarctica. And uh, as you probably know, um, there's no place really for trees in Antarctica anymore. So he was able to show uh, in that uh, first 10 years of the 20th century that um, Antarctica had not always had the uh, kind of climate that it has today. That uh, a long time ago, there were in fact other things in, in the area uh, and they could live down there without any trouble. So um, very interesting uh, observation that led ultimately to people realizing that continents don't always stay in the same place, that they in fact move around the world. Um, <clears throat> in 2003, the, our first stop was uh, one of these routes to the South Pole. And uh, this is our camp. And our camp's a very large one because there were about 30 scientific expeditions that collected in this camp. And we worked as a unit uh, in terms of some things uh, for logistics, but our own camp was in fact much smaller. Uh, there were six people and uh, we had a, a separate camp uh, than the rest of the camps and we ate alone. And every day what we were supposed to be doing was being transported up to Mount Kirkpatrick. Now, Mount Kirkpatrick is a very high mountain. It's more than 10,000 feet. And uh, we were working at more than 9,000 feet above sea level. And because of the fact that it was so high and so cold, even though it was the summer months, uh, they did not want us to camp there. So we had to camp in this base camp, uh, which was at about 2,000 uh, feet above sea level. and. Uh, uh, Every day they would fly us up to Mount Kirkpatrick and back to this camp at a lower level where we, where we were safer. And uh, that's the way it goes. Now, the trouble is that um, Mount Kirkpatrick is in the background. And uh, much of the time, the higher levels of the mountains are covered in clouds. And that means that uh, when they're covered with clouds like that, helicopters can't see where they're going necessarily. And so they won't take you up there. And sometimes uh, the weather was very bad at the lower levels where our camp was, where we had uh, very fierce winds and blowing snow. And then the helicopters wouldn't take us up either. The net result was that of the 28 days that we spent in Antarctica, uh, in my first expedition there in 2003, we only had six days where we could actually go up to Mount Kirkpatrick to work on the dinosaur. And uh, that's not very many. It's a very inefficient way of doing things, um, but it's a lot safer and safety is the most important thing when you're in a situation like this where it's uh, very, very dangerous at all counts. Uh, this is the top of Mount Kirkpatrick, uh, not the top, the shoulder. And uh, this is where the dinosaur was found. Uh, you can see the helicopter coming in. And uh, it transported all of uh, the uh, equipment in and uh, personnel as well, of course, every day, as I mentioned. But it was also used to transport the fossils out of the, the area, too. In the uh, right side of this picture, you can see that uh, clouds have started to cover this site. Um, and this frequently happened. Uh, and we had to be very careful that uh, we would call the helicopters if, in fact, uh, we noticed that these clouds were creeping too high up the mountain because they had to get us out fast. Uh, otherwise, we were equipped uh, to camp on the top of the mountain. Uh, but I would have to say it's a very cold place to camp. 
even though it's uh, uh, summer months, as I said, and we have 24 hours of sunlight, nevertheless, it never got warmer than minus 20 degrees uh, Celsius up here, which is below zero degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, on really cold days, it was as cold as minus 30, which is almost the same in both Celsius and Fahrenheit. Um, so it was a tough place to work. Uh, this is Bill Hammer from Rock Island. And uh, uh, when they left in uh, 1990, after the first quarrying attempt, uh, all of these chisels were left on top of the mountain because of the fact they did not have time to take them out. And as I said, they did not have time to finish excavating the dinosaur. Uh, in 1989 and 1990, they'd only finished excavating about a third of the dinosaur. The rest of the dinosaur still had to be collected later. Uh, took us uh, um, all those years from 1990 to 2003 to raise enough money to go back to Antarctica. It's a very expensive place to work, needless to say. And, uh, but uh, the quarry was exactly the same as it had been left in, in 1990. And uh, so what Bill is showing here is the uh, chisels that were knocked in the ground and they were left there in 1990. And they used the chisels to try and find those dinosaur bones. The bones that they got out mostly in 1990 were from the skull of the dinosaur. And uh, to the left is the part that they collected. To the right is a reconstruction of the skull. And uh, the bones at the bottom of the picture and teeth, those are bones that we found in 2003 in the same area. This is a very unusual large dinosaur. Uh, it's about the size of Allosaurus. And it's different in the sense that uh, across the top of the head is a crest. And that crest kind of looks like a snow shovel turned sideways on the top of the head. So it's very weird looking. The dinosaur is called Cryolophosaurus, which means frozen crested lizard. And the only known specimen of this dinosaur in the entire world is that specimen that was found in Antarctica. Um, so it's a very important dinosaur. <clears throat> now, I mentioned the temperatures, and the temperatures make it very difficult to find dinosaurs, of course, because of all the snow and ice there. Uh, but they also make it very difficult to collect dinosaurs. And uh, we can't use traditional techniques there. And so what we had to do was find the dinosaur bones. And you may notice in the center of the picture, there is a line of round, round things. What those are is cross sections of ribs of that dinosaur. And uh, unlike other places where we would uncover the ribs in their entirety, and then we would uh, basically use plaster and burlap to cover them up so we could take them back to the museum and do the preparation there. Here, the uh, plaster and burlap technique could not be used because the water would freeze immediately. And if the water freezes, then uh, it doesn't set the plaster, and then you can't take the bones out that way. So we had to basically break this dinosaur apart in pieces and number all those pieces so that they could be glued back together when they're back in the laboratory. And then we could take the rock off them. And I would have to tell you that this is the hardest rock I've ever worked in in my life. Not because it was cold, but just because, uh, as you can see, these conchoidal fractures through the rock and so on, it was just very well mineralized. And so the technique actually worked very well. Um, and uh, uh, trying to break that rock, though, was very difficult. And in this case, uh, you can see these, this line of chisels. And the idea was to try and perforate the rock along lines so that uh, you could break off pieces of it and uh, um, these are called feather chisels. And uh, you uh, basically drill holes first, put the feathers inside those holes, and then you drive a chisel between them. But because the rock was so hard and diff difficult to work with, it didn't always break the way you thought. You could line the rock up or these holes up the way that uh, we've tried to here, and uh, still wouldn't guarantee that it would break along that line. It was, it was just crazy work. 
So uh, we used jackhammers, uh, we used rock saws, and we also used dynamite. And uh, dynamite is uh, something that isn't used as often anymore, uh, simply because it's difficult to control. But a good dynamite expert, as this man was, uh, knows exactly what to do. And uh, he can blow off a couple of inches of rock at the same time and uh, stay above the bone so that we could uh, focus our attention not on removing rock, but on removing the rock that had the bone in it. So a very difficult thing to do. Uh, it was difficult to keep the equipment going because it was so cold. As I said, most days it was minus 30 up there. And some days, so it was minus, uh, uh, as warm as minus 20. That's still awfully cold. Uh, in the end though, on the very last day, this big chunk of the dinosaur broke off. And uh, uh, that's uh, about a third of the dinosaur skeleton in that rock, uh, which we loaded onto a net. Um, we went back again uh, many years later and uh, we got the rest of it. And uh, <clears throat> this is our crew looking very happy after breaking off one of these chunks of rock, which was then flown out of there by helicopter and down to lower levels. The bones were then taken to Rock Island, Illinois, where they were prepared. Uh, the bones that were found in 1990, some of them are still not prepared out of the rock because that rock is so hard. And essentially the technician here is using a miniature jackhammer to slowly remove the rock to expose those bones. And it takes a lot of work to do that and a tremendous amount of time. But this specimen, which is uh, on display both in Rock Island and also in the Field Museum in Chicago, uh, is probably one of the most uh, expensive, most amazing specimens of dinosaurs uh, found anywhere in the world, in my opinion. Um, funny thing was that on our third expedition to Antarctica to collect this dinosaur, and that's where we collected the rest of it, uh, two or three days before the last day that we were there, uh, another dinosaur was found just upslope from the Cryolophosaurus. And uh, that had been there all of this time, and we just had never seen it. And uh, in this case, instead of being uh, dark brown bones uh, or almost black bones inside of white or gray rocks, this time it was red bones inside a whitish sandstone. And the rock was much softer. And this dinosaur was much smaller. It was only about the size of a, a sheep. Uh, this dinosaur uh, was again, mostly present. And this dinosaur represented an entirely different kind of animal. And uh, although it was uh, the last days of the last expedition that we were down there, nevertheless, the rock was soft enough that we could collect uh, almost the whole thing. The only thing that was left in the uh, rock wall was the hand of one hand of the dinosaur. And uh, at some point, we're going to have to go back and get that and collect that. But uh, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of dinosaur material uh, that still needs to be found, not just in Antarctica and Arctic Canada or Greenland or Alaska. Uh, there's dinosaurs to be found all over the world. And what you need to do is um, just put the effort into it. Uh, we in fact know relatively little about dinosaurs uh, because it takes so much effort to collect specimens and prepare them. Uh, every dinosaur represent years and years of work. Um, polar dinosaurs are special dif especially difficult to collect because of where they're found. Uh, but those dinosaurs are very important to understanding as well how dinosaurs moved around the world, how they moved between continents as well. Um, so uh, it's a little bit about my life, uh, not the flashy specimens that Roy Chapman Andrews was collecting in Mongolia or the flashy ones that we find in Alberta and the Western US, but uh, nevertheless, it's part of the uh, work that we do uh, exploring for science. Thank you. Well, terrific, Professor Curry. And uh, there we go.
and you are spotlighted still. And this is a good segue now to the Q&A portion of our, our show today. So we now understand your title, uh, Dinosaur Collecting from Pole to Pole. I, I was expecting it to be across the world, but I'm fascinated uh, to, to see how much work you've done uh, in the polar regions of both hemispheres. So as you described, it's not all fun and games. And as we're awaiting questions from the audience, um, along those lines, uh, do you have uh, anything to tell the students who might be interested in science and they see these marvelous discoveries, these beautiful fossil specimens, uh, but may not appreciate what goes into it. Uh, the value of patience, uh, is this something you learned as an explorer or did you have it and that drew, drew you to the field of paleontology or what would you like to say about that? Well, for me, I guess I, I have very little patience when it comes to traffic lights or filling out paperwork. Uh, but I have uh, infinite patience when it comes to working on dinosaurs, so I can uh, uh, prepare a dinosaur uh, for day after day after day and only see a little bit of progress every day. But I, I have that kind of patience and I get very excited about uh, all of the bone that gets exposed and how it gets exposed and everything else. Uh, you, when you're really interested in something, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of science you're looking at or what kind of um, whatever, um, <clears throat> your patience becomes infinite. And, uh, uh, you know, it's not to say that at times you're not impatient, you would like to like it to go faster, but you realize that if you go too fast, then you might destroy it. And that that's uh, an important aspect of this is, is making sure that uh, you have enough patience to do the job so that it's done right. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thank you. We are getting questions fast and furious at this point. So let me uh, share a few of these. Uh, one question, where do you find the most dinosaur bones? I'm not sure if this refers to a geographic region or the type of rock. Um, but are there places that you you just hone in on just knowing with your expertise where to start looking? Well, one of the reasons I live in Alberta is because Alberta is one of the richest places in the world for dinosaurs. Uh, we have a place in southern Alberta called Dinosaur Provincial Park. Dinosaur Provincial Park is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site because it's got so much dinosaur bone. And uh, we've collected uh, in the past century more than a thousand dinosaur skeletons from that park. And uh, when I go down there in the summer, um, there are places where I can't step on the ground without stepping on dinosaur bone. There are literally millions of broken pieces of dinosaur bone all over the place. Mm -hmm. And there are similar sites down in uh, Montana and the Dakotas and Wyoming and, and so on as well that uh, produce a tremendous number of dinosaurs. So Western North America is one of the very best places for looking for dinosaurs anywhere. Uh, Mongolia, where Roy Chapman Andrews worked, and, and the Gobi Desert of China as well, uh, are also incredibly rich uh, dinosaur sites. And the interesting thing is that those dinosaurs there are from about the same age as the dinosaurs here in Western Canada. And uh, so they uh, give us different information about dinosaurs that were related to each other. And uh, that's, that's kind of fun if what you're trying to do is understand, uh, say, how dinosaurs moved around the world or what their biology was. Um, they're very good. Mm -hmm. uh, dinosaurs have been found, though, on every single continent. And uh, um, we've got uh, uh, very good sites in Africa, very good sites in uh, South America, especially Argentina. Uh, believe it or not, even uh, very heavily populated areas in Europe have produced dinosaurs. And uh, um, you just got to know the age of the rocks that are exposed there and that they in fact represent uh, the right kinds of environments for dinosaurs to have been living in uh, back at the time that they were alive. And uh, you know, there are a lot of dinosaur sites known, uh, but there are a lot more that need to be found. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of had the impression when I was a kid that we knew everything there was to know about dinosaurs. Uh, the truth is we probably have found 
less than 1% of all dinosaurs that actually lived. I mean, we're talking about species now. Mm -hmm. And so although we know of about a thousand dinosaurs, there are still thousands of dinosaurs still to be found. So it sounds like there's room for more paleontologists among students in the audience if they're interested in that field. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, here's a question. Uh, was the climate different in the polar regions when the dinosaurs were alive there, uh, or were the rocks located at different latitudes at that time? Yeah, the Arctic uh, during the Cretaceous period was actually even further north than it is now. Um, <clears throat> so continental drift does move continents around. <clears throat> and uh, Antarctica uh, during the age of dinosaurs was a little closer to the equator but not that much closer. Uh, so definitely climates have changed over the years. And uh, really we're living in a, a time period when it's relatively cold as far as the history of the earth is concerned. Um, during the age of dinosaurs uh, in Western North America, the Gulf of Mexico at times extended all the way up into the Arctic Ocean. And uh, because you had these warm currents of water going into the Arctic, you didn't have permafrost developing. Uh, therefore, it never really got that cold. It did snow during winter months. So dinosaurs, uh, uh, which were fairly tolerant of cold weather as well, uh, they could live there, but still it wasn't a good place for them. And that's because like today, the polar regions uh, during the age of dinosaurs still had 24 hours of darkness during the middle of winter. And when you have 24 hours of darkness, that means you can't have plants. If you're a plant eater, you can't eat. Uh, so you've got to get out of there. Uh, and if you're a meat eater, then when all the plant eaters leave, then you got to get out of there too. So dinosaurs really couldn't stay in those polar regions during the winter months, not because of the cold. Uh, some of them may have in fact hibernated, that's one idea, uh, but uh, most of them probably left. And uh, uh, it's much like today. Um, during the summer months, you have the opposite situation. You have 24 hours of sunlight, with 24 hours of sunlight, you have high plant productivity and uh, many, many mammals and birds and insects will migrate into the polar regions, especially the Arctic, because you have so much plant growth and uh, so much plant productivity that it's a very good place for those animals to be during the summer months. And they take advantage of it. Dinosaurs did exactly the same. Hmm, interesting. So despite climate change, the constant with today is the, the long periods of darkness or light in polar regions that created challenges and opportunities. So here's a question. Everybody's fascinated with dinosaurs and, and probably the most fascinating of all are, are Tyrannosaurus rex that captures so many people's imagination. Question from the audience. Have you ever found T-Rex bones yourself? Oh yeah, many. And in fact, uh, one of my areas of expertise is uh, Tyrannosaurus rex and other dinosaurs that are related to Tyrannosaurus. So for example, this is, uh, this is an Albertosaurus tooth. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can make it out, but yeah. uh, this is just like a Tyrannosaurus rex tooth, just a little bit smaller. And this is the root of the tooth. Mm. This is the crown of the tooth. And you won't be able to see it, but uh, along the front and the back of the tooth are these serrations. Hmm. And uh, it's just like a Tyrannosaur, Tyrannosaurus rex tooth. We find Tyrannosaurus rex in Alberta as well. And uh, in fact, this, this is not from Alberta. This is a cast of uh, a Tyrannosaurus rex baby from Montana. And uh, it's one of the dinosaurs I like to work with as well. And uh, these dinosaurs, uh, I find are fascinating because uh, it's one of the most sophisticated meat-eating dinosaurs there ever was. Uh, it's not only the largest one, but it was also one of the most sophisticated. And uh, uh, baby tyrannosaurs are... Uh, very sophisticated in their own way as well, but in a different way. They, they in fact, uh, were much lighter built, 
than uh, the adult Tyrannosaurus rexes, and they were very fast animals, probably. Um, so they're fascinating animals as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you might see over my head uh, another dinosaur skull. Um, that's a different Tyrannosaur, and that one's from Mongolia. That's an animal called Tarbosaurus, and that's another one that I've collected many specimens of and done a lot of uh, research on as well. Very cool dinosaurs. Great, and you've just shown why it's been a, a nice opportunity to do this meeting virtually because you're able to show these fossils. Probably harder to get them through customs. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so thanks for showing that. Speaking of fascination, someone in the audience is fascinated by the canned bone marrow, <laughs> is wondering what you ate, whether you ate bone marrow or whether you had a more palatable diet. Can you share right. your experiences with food in explorations in polar regions? Yeah, I've tried the bone marrow. Um, it's a very high energy source of food. It's basically uh, fat and uh, blood cells and so on. Um, but uh, uh, I would say it's not my preference. And uh, most of the time I do eat uh, quite well. Uh, we uh, manage to take things to our camps. But uh, in our travels, of course, um, it's it doesn't make sense to drag food all around the world with you uh, sometimes we do it by preference uh, maybe a jar of peanut butter or something but uh, for the most part we eat what we get where we go and so when we work in mongolia or china we're eating mongolian food or chinese food particularly when we're out in, in the desert um, down in the Antarctica, actually, uh, the diets are much better now. You can uh, take food down there and, uh, of course, you freeze it. Um, you know, where our camp was, we were actually uh, on top of one mile thick of ice of a glacier. And so you just dig a hole, essentially, and uh, you bury your food mm -hmm. and uh, um, defrost it when you need it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we ate very well there, but it wasn't fresh. <laughs> yeah, no worries about polar bears in Antarctica, at least. Oh, exactly. <laughs> so, well, here's an interesting question. For someone who studies the past, do you find it stressful knowing you control people's perception of the past? You unlock doors to people's understanding of past climates, past behavior of animals. Do you feel a, a re certain responsibility that waits on you in that kind of research? Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, people uh, often used, to, well, they still do ask me why I study dinosaurs, why it's so important. And um, I have to admit that it's because I liked dinosaurs when I was a kid and I never grew up. But uh, uh, in terms of why uh, it's important for people to understand about dinosaurs, uh, you start to see patterns uh, in Earth history. And of course, we see the same kinds of patterns in human history as well. We can look at the Roman Empire and see what mistakes they made. We can learn from those mistakes if we want to. But it's the same with nature. And when we look at dinosaurs, uh, we realize that most dinosaurs died out in a big extinction event 65 million years ago. And uh, uh, that extinction event, which ended 150 million year reign of dinosaurs of the entire world um, that ended for reasons that could affect us. Um, we now realize that, of course, it's a very complex thing. That extinction isn't something that happens for one single reason. Uh, we know that it may have been concluded because an asteroid hit the world about 65 million years ago. And when that asteroid hit the uh, Earth, basically it blew a hole in the Earth and it threw so much dust in the air that the dust went around the Earth in the atmosphere many, many times and shut the sun out for months and months and months. And if you're a big dinosaur, um, that's not a very good situation because if you're a plant eater and the sun's gone for months, it means your food's all gone. That means you die. Uh, if you're a meat eater, you don't have the big plant eaters to eat, so you die, and uh, you have a complete um, environmental collapse, an ecological collapse. And uh, uh, part of the problem, though, was also caused because uh, the 
Earth's climate was changing at the end of the age of dinosaurs. It was getting more continental. And as you get more continental climates, you get fewer and fewer species that can live in those situations. So you get a reduction of biodiversity. And if you get a reduction in biodiversity, then uh, you set yourself up for much worse effects if something catastrophic happens, like the asteroid. And so I think if the asteroid had hit the Earth probably 10 million years earlier, when there were more dinosaurs, when there were more other animals and plants around, I don't think it would have had the same effect. Uh, but it was just bad timing. And uh, so that uh, ended the reign of dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. Now we're living in a world where we're looking at a reduction of diversity. And I think the warning signs are there that uh, an asteroid could hit the Earth again. It has hit the Earth uh, multiple times in the past. Um, asteroids have hit the Earth multiple times in the past. There have been major extinction events multiple times in the past. It's going to happen again at some point in time, and we can't necessarily control that. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us, I think, to try and maintain biodiversity worldwide, to uh, be ready for whatever happens, that whatever catastrophe happens. Uh, mm -hmm. There are many lessons that can be learned from dinosaurs. That's great. Lessons from the past that are applicable to right now. Thanks for the warning. Now, a logical follow-up question is, were it not for the big asteroid impact, would dinosaurs have gone on indefinitely, possibly even till today? Well, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that dinosaurs actually still are around today. Um, birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs. And we have many uh, dinosaurs that uh, uh, had feathers on them. So for example, this is a little animal called Velociraptor. And Velociraptor, you know of probably from Jurassic Park, but uh, Velociraptor and many of the meat-eating dinosaurs had feathers covering their bodies. And that's because those dinosaurs are very, very closely related to birds. And uh, since the year 2000, uh, most scientists now have accepted the fact that birds are not only the descendants of those dinosaurs, but they actually are under a modern biological classification system. They are classified as part of the dinosauria. So dinosaurs technically are not extinct. We have more than 10,000 living dinosaurs today. Um, they had to change. They had to become smaller. Uh, and the big dinosaurs didn't survive. And they got replaced eventually by our relatives. Uh, different types of mammals uh, have filled in those niches that were left vacant by the dinosaurs that did die out. Uh, but still, dinosaurs as birds are still very successful and very diverse. Great. Thank you. And um, another question here, uh, we're getting a little bit past our time. If people want to continue, this is wonderful. Um, a question that's, that's a big picture. Uh, a person asks, what made you want to go into this field? Now, uh, you touched on it a moment ago. And, and I'll add, do you have any recommendations for students, uh, high school students, middle school students who are interested in dinosaurs in particular, paleontology or sciences in general? What kind of courses do you recommend or experiences would you recommend they seek? Well, uh, dinosaurs, uh, in spite of the fact that they're popular, they're still underrepresented in the sciences, we'll say. Uh, there's only about 150 people worldwide who are paid to do research on dinosaurs. And uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, maybe, uh, but it's a lot compared to what we've had in the past. Uh, when I was growing up, there weren't very many dinosaur people at all, less than a dozen. And uh, um, so I didn't have a very good chance of getting a job because with only a dozen positions in the entire world, how are you going to get a job? How are you going to compete with all the people who want to work on dinosaurs? Mm -hmm. But I decided that, um, well, the important thing was for me to study dinosaurs. It was, it was to learn about them. 
and to uh, try and find a way that I could satisfy my curiosity about dinosaurs. So my intention was to become uh, probably an educator at university or college level in biology or geology. And uh, when I had the opportunity, then I would go and work on dinosaurs. Um, and the funny thing is that uh, I was uh, timed, I timed things just right uh, for the increase in the number of paleontologists to happen. Now, the number of paleontologists worldwide, as I said, is about 150 right now who are employed to do dinosaurs uh, as researchers. But there are many other jobs associated with that. There's all our technicians, there's collections managers, there's uh, artists who reconstruct the way dinosaurs looked and so on. And uh, so the number of positions worldwide is actually much bigger than that. Um, different people have approached uh, their interest in different ways and found jobs uh, in different uh, fields to still be able to work on dinosaurs. And that's pretty exciting, I think. Uh, the main thing I think uh, I would tell you is that if you're really keen on doing that or anything else, just try and do it. Um, and uh, if you've got the talents and you've got the determination, um, you could be like me, you end up doing exactly what you want to do in the end. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, you mentioned your good fortune, and it reminds me of Roy Chapman Andrews, who said he was born under a lucky star. So uh, good good luck plays a role in, in your career and his career and, and uh, so on. So good to keep that in mind, too. Um, we're getting close now to 1230, our time, and so we probably want to wrap this up. One last question for you, a specific one. When you return to a site, uh, maybe years later, how do you mark it? Do you flag it? GPS coordinates nowadays? And have you ever returned to a marked location and discovered it was gone for whatever reason? Yeah, uh, it is a bit of a problem because, uh, um, you know, we find more dinosaur skeletons than we can actually excavate. And so every year we might find uh, 10 to 20 skeletons in Alberta alone. Uh, and we can only excavate probably two of those because of the amount of time and effort it takes. So it's very important to be able to mark them. And it used to be we marked them all on air photos, uh, but today we use GPS. Uh, we can return uh, with much greater accuracy and much faster to those sites. And uh, we frequently do return to the same sites year after year, uh, looking at them just to see if more of the bones have eroded out. Um, and uh, Sometimes we do return though as well and find that um, they've been destroyed either by human action, a new road going through for, for example, uh, or just by erosion. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, well, thank you. And I know we're starting to lose people because they need to move off to class. Uh, thanks for the extra time you've provided. There's been a lot of great questions and you've been very accommodating with your time for the presentation and the Q&A. And I wanna remind everybody, if you wanna hear more about Professor Curry and his explorations, he's only scratched the surface. He's gonna talk a lot more on Friday afternoon at the Beloit Public Library, 4.30 open public event. So please attend that one as well. And so for now, I'm gonna give a, a virtual big hand to you for your time today. And um, uh, once again, thanks. And we look forward to seeing you in Beloit in just a few more days. Look forward to coming. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.